Okay. You can hear the audio. And check the desktop. All right, looks like we're ready to go. So uh, I want to introduce, this is our first speaker for the semester. This is uh, Jancy McPhee, Dr. Jancy McPhee. She's a neuroscientist and she's a former manager of domestic and international space life sciences research programs. Ever since uh, 2010, she's been working to find motivating and novel ways to enhance space education, foster science and technology innovation, promote global collaboration, and to solve hard problems. She created the International Humans and in Space Art Program to encourage people of all ages, cultures, and backgrounds to communicate their visions of the future of human space exploration and develop through visionary literature, musical, and video art. So far, the program has engaged thousands of artists and hundreds of thousands have viewed multimedia artwork displays and performances online, locally, worldwide, and in space. Through her nonprofit Sci Art Exchange, she offers global science integrated with art activities and training to inspire and prepare the world for the future of humans in space. She also provides consulting for uh, corporations and educational organizations. So, uh, I think that this was a really appropriate first speaker, partly because one of the big things she's going to be talking about is science communication, which is, like I said last week, the biggest thing that I expect from you guys this semester. So I think it's going to be a really interesting talk. And I hand it over to uh, Jancy. Thank you, David. And you guys are going to hear a little bit of a reiteration of some of what he said during the talk. So. There'll be a couple of take-home me messages I hope that will stick. And uh, it's really lovely to be here, and it's always great to be first, right, David? Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking forward to talking to you. So let's see. Wow. It's, it's okay. So let me just tell you a little bit more about myself to give you some context. So I was that kid who was really not sure what she wanted to be when she grew up. So I had great teachers in a lot of different classes. I really loved science and I, was, and I was good at it. But my mom was the arty kind of person and all of my hobbies were music and theater. And so I was really afraid by making a choice of either science and engineering or the arts that I would miss a lot of really cool things down a different pathway. So it was a tough thing for me. Uh, I did decide, however, to become a neuroscientist. And if you don't know what a neuroscientist is, that's a biologist who studies the nerves in the mind and the body. And for me, that was a wonderful compromise because it was basically the science of how we think, move, and create. So it was just a blend of all of my, my interests. And my, my research work got very, very specialized. I was down to studying cells and single molecules and parts of molecules. And I started to miss the big picture, and I moved on to, to doing international space life sciences research collaborations for NASA. And it was essentially herding cats because people were, they came from different backgrounds as professionals, but they also came from different countries. But the experience was fascinating, and I learned a lot from both my years as a research laboratory research scientist and my years as a research coordinator. And I started the work that I'm going to talk to you about today while I was still a scientist at NASA, but it is currently under our nonprofit, SciArt Exchange, and the nonprofit has a focus on three important principles that I decided really needed to be worked on in order to safeguard the advance of space and science and technology. And those three principles are to engage and educate, to innovate, and to collaborate. So let me just give you a, a little overview of what we're going to talk about today. This is science, so what? And our basic topics include that we are going to talk about this question, science, so what, and talk about that 
we can relay science relevance and also foster the advancement of science by doing some, some key activities. And we're also going to talk about how good science is not just facts. You also have to make people care about it. And also touch on some tips about how you can think about science in order to make yourself a better scientist a better, and a better science communicator. And I'm going to tell you that one of the tools is to integrate the arts in some way into your work. And I'm going to give you a couple examples of how we're doing that as a nonprofit. And then I'm going to talk about an opportunity that you have right now to practice the skills that we're going to talk about. So the first thing I want to know is, does everybody know what STEM stands for? Science, technology, engineering, and math. Has anybody ever heard of STEAM? OK, so for those who have not, STEAM is STEM plus the arts. So it's, a, it's an educational movement, and I, but I just want to define those two terms because I, they may come out of my mouth while we're, while we're talking this evening, and I want to be sure you understand. And who knows or is interested in space? All right, this is Clear Lake, Texas, isn't it? The home of NASA Johnson Space Center. All right, well, we've just confirmed that again. So thank you. I just wanted to do a check on, on understanding who the audience was. So let me tell you a little bit about what's the genesis for the work that I'm going to talk about. So space, the future of space exploration and development has a lot of challenges associated with it. They range from, the, from needing to develop science and technology to having the right mission strategies. Uh, money is always an issue. Timing, is are these advances going to happen 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now? Do we have the political support that we need? Are we doing what we can right now to develop the workforce that we're going to need in the future and our existing workforce as well because learning is never done? So those are huge challenges and as I, this is related to what I told you before, my primary interest in helping to overcome those challenges is to focus on how we communicate about science, being creative with science, and facilitating science teamwork. We're not going to talk about teamwork today, though. We're going to talk about communication and creativity. So we're going to start with communication. And I'm going to show you two examples of science communication. And while I'm doing that, I'd like you to think about whether you think it's a good example or a bad example. So we'll start with this first one. This one actually comes from the Clear Lake newsletter. And so I apologize very much if any of you are the author of this uh, newsletter or of the next example. Uh, it's usually a pretty safe audience when I'm talking to people because it's not Clear Lake. But let me just read this to you. It says, Martian meteorites in the evolution of Mars. Insights into the duration of igneous activity and the nature of magma sources in Mars are made from analyses of sugar-type meteorites mapped to ultramafic igneous rocks from Mars crust. And at the end of this little invitation to a lecture was, this will be a talk for a general audience. <laughs> so how many people thought this was a good example of communication? Hmm, okay. Well, let's see what the next one looks like, shall we? Our meteorite traveled millions of miles to get here. The least you could do is touch it. Science is freaking awesome. And this is from a museum in, um, I think it was Chicago. It's the, it's the Adler Planetarium. So how many people think that that's an engaging way? The, the audience here was the public. How many people think that's a good way to draw people in? Thank you. So I think we're in general agreement here about What's the difference between good and bad science communication? So we're off to a really good start. So, what, so we realize that when we're talking to the public or to others that we have to do a good job talking about science. But what you might not realize is that by learning how to talk about science, you're also going to do better science. And so what happens is, is that there's actually a general improvement in your science quality when you learn and think about how you are thinking about your science and your ability to relay what you're doing to others. And it can do things like help you to remember the big picture, 
give you insights into the next steps of your research. It can help you to communicate to collaborators and identify those collaborators, be more innovative, really tell a complete story, and also, and this is very important, to get those better papers written and to write communicating grant proposals because that's the reality of how a lot of science is funded. So communication is not just talking to the public. It's also talking to yourself and your peers. So we can learn a lot of tips about science communication by actually looking and learning from some of the classic great communicators. So does anybody know who the guy in the top left is, or right? <laughs> uh, who knows who that is? You want to try? Oh, no. You do? You got it. Awesome. Yes, thank you. So Charles Darwin, of course, has not been around for quite a while, but he wrote something like 120 papers to communicate about his work. And if you realize that that was before we had word processors and computers, you will realize what an amazing feat that is. Do you know who the next one is? Bill Nye. And then do you actually know who this woman is? Yes, that's right. Uh, she's, she's popular for uh, a show called Talk Nerdy to Me. And do you know who the last guy is? Yeah, Neil deGrasse Tyson. And do you know who his mentor was? Yes, excellent. Thank you so much. And he is one of the, the, the best examples of a science communicator. He's not alive anymore. But he was very prolific, and he had this fantastic television show called Cosmos. So we have lots of, lots of good communicators from whom we can take examples. So I'm going to give you three basic science communication tips this evening, because we don't have a ton of time. The first one is know your audience. Are they your peers, or are they the public? Are they your potential funders or politicians? What age? are they? And sometimes it's a little bit hard because it might be a diverse group, but you still have to do an assessment. What do they, what are their interests? What do they have in common with you? It's, it's all very important. Even venue can be an important part of that. And depending on how you answer the question, who is your audience, it may actually change not just what you say, but the flow of what you say. In general, when we talk to scientists, we give a lot of context and background. Because we scientists, we hate to be misleading. So we want to give all the background of why we're doing what we're doing before we get to what we did and why it was cool. But when you speak to the public, their attention span can be a lot shorter. And it's also very classic right now that the way journal articles are written, that you basically give the most important message in the very first sentence. And then you start to pile on the context and the background for that. So it can make a very big difference. The second tip is tell them the so what. Why should they care about what you're doing? How, will, how does it influence them? How is it connected to them? If they don't care, they're going to tune out. So you really need to relay that point. You need to tell them the why, not just the how. And in the words of saint Exupéry, who wrote Le Petit Prince, has anybody ever read that book as a kid? The Little Prince? Seriously? He says it very eloquently. He says, if you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood. Teach them to long for the sea. Tell them why they should care. And tell it simply. Because according to Einstein, if you can't say it simply, then you probably don't understand it yourself. And it's a dead giveaway to your audience. Now, it can be really difficult to figure out exactly what you want to tell. Tell your audience. And there are a lot of different devices and techniques and tips and tricks, but that's going to take another couple of hours of lectures. So we're not going to go through all of them, but there's one sort of Interesting basic one that might help you to identify your bottom line message that you need to communicate and structure it. And it's called the and, but, and the therefore principle. So you, you say what we know and this and that and that. What is new and that's the but, then we found this and why it matters. Therefore, we concluded. 
So this is just one example. Sea level was relatively stable for out 8,000 years, and coastal communities were built on the assumption of stability, but over the past 150 years, the level has been rising. Therefore, a new approach to coastline management is needed. So that's one, just one of many tools to help you identify your <coughs> message that you wish to communicate and structure it. The third tip to a successful communication is to tell a story. And that's very important for humans because we have been telling stories since we became modern humans. And there's lots of evidence for that. Stories are very important to humans and very effective for communication. Another reason they're really important is because there are hormones behind storytelling. There's lots of different hormones that are released during a story, and they help you to remember and to connect emotions to what the story is about. So it's a very, very effective tool. Now, it can be quite difficult to find your science story. And again, that's another thing that takes some time, and we can talk about that maybe some other day. But let me just give you a you know, a little advice that the story could be your science itself or it could be the story of your process of discovery. Both, both of those angles can, can give a framework for an engaging communication about your work. But be careful, when you become a really good science communicator, you need to keep your eye on the ethics because sometimes really effective science communication can lead to problems. So just bear in mind that when you get really good at what you do, you need to pay attention to what you're saying. So there are lots of different ways to make your story interesting. You can use all sorts of literary devices. You can use analogies and metaphors and everybody who tells, you know, mini stories and personal anecdotes and um, humor. I love this because it's it's you know, the nutritional value of grandma from Little Red Riding Hood. And uh, it, all of these devices can be very helpful. Multimedia can also be extremely helpful, and we're going to talk more about that in a minute. And also, I hope by now you all realize that jargon is a problem. And there's a really cool thing on the web that you can try to tell your story in one, in using only the top 1,000 words used in English, and it's called the Upgoer 5 activity, and it's really a blast. And so somebody did that for NASA's Saturn V rocket, and they had to call it the Upgoer 5 because the words Saturn and NASA was not among the top 1,000 words. So it's really a lot of fun, makes a great party activity. Uh, but it's also very humbling, and it reminds you how cautious you need to be about the words you use when you communicate. So that's, that's what I want to talk about, about communication. Now I'd like to touch on the second principle I want to talk about, which is creativity. So good science and engineering are always evolving, both in our understanding of it and in our capabilities. So one way... So that's one way in which it stays relevant and addresses the so what. It's because it's constantly evolving to the needs of the local and broader community. In order to evolve and advance, you have to underlie those innovations with creativity, which is a skill. And in order to learn about creativity, we can look at people we identify as being creative and see what they have to say and think about their personality. So this is Robert Heinlein, who is a famous sci-fi writer. And in his words, specialization is for insects, not for humans, not for creative humans. So we're going we're gonna to expand on that in a minute. If you look at what Einstein had to say, imagination is more powerful than knowledge. So, you know, most of us who have pursued science have spent most of their time learning all the details and the facts from the knowledge. But according to this, these two gentlemen, that's not sufficient for going beyond the facts of science and being truly creative and advancing the field. 
We can also learn a little bit about creativity, and this is, you know, this is my thing, by looking at neuroscience and psychology. And in a very grossly simplified way, creativity is when you connect two thoughts or two experiences or a thought and an experience in a novel way. It's how you connect. So one of the important things to do is to not just have this specialization, which honestly we all need that to be practicing scientists, but to make sure that you do expose yourself to broad experiences because you will be creative in the way you connect all, everything that's in your brain. And please use your whole brain, not one half of it. I think that would be really a waste. Another thing that's important to remember is that the creative process has multiple phases of thinking. The first is that preparation phase, that phase where you get your skills, you get your knowledge, you do your background research. But then there are two phases in the middle, incubation and illumination, which are, are a little bit different. They're not quite such a focused analytical phase. You're not staring straight at the problem. And this is where those, those connections, those novel connections between what you know and what you're thinking about and all your experiences will occur. And for many people, they need to do things to get into the right mental state to, to actually make these new connections. So I'll just use myself as an example. Uh, most of the best research that I did as a scientist was in Seattle, Washington. And in the winter in Seattle, there is sun for exactly 30 minutes from 1 to 1.30 p.m. And at that time, the entire laboratory empties out and everybody goes outside. So we used to have a little running club. We would just go and run about, you know, like do kind of like a 5K and then, you know, return to the lab all sweaty, ready to go. Well, there was this amazing thing that whatever was the research challenge that I had over that day or those several days, I almost always had an idea what to do next after that run because my brain was busy thinking about it, but I was distracted enough that I wasn't focusing and thinking about it in exactly the same way and beating my head against the wall. I had allowed myself to get into a slightly different mental state. A lot of people say that they have their most creative moments when they're, when they're asleep or in the shower. And some, for some people, it's meditation or, or after meditation. So you need to do a little self-knowledge to figure out, you know, what helps me to, to consider my problems, and I mean your, your intellectual problems, or maybe it would also work with the other problems. You know, you'll have to try and let me know. And how, how do I get myself into that state? You know, it's going to take a little self-knowledge. So that's another tip. The other thing is to be aware there is more than one way to approach a problem. And most of us in this room have been thinking about the scientific method, and it's an excellent way to be taught how to approach a problem. But it's not the only way. There is a, another sort of classic design, design process for approaching problems. It involves, it's very user-centric, it's very early prototyping, and it's comically displayed as this incredibly messy early process that essentially iterates until the best solution is found. It's a little bit closer to the way an artist might approach a new work of art. There's kind of a nebulous idea. They're not really sure. And it's kind of once they jump in there, put their hands in, part of what's going on gets evolved in the process of doing. So it's important to respect and be aware that there are different ways of approaching problems and to be willing to try some of the other ones when you're stuck. So to kind of summarize here, what is creativity? Creativity is this Venn diagram. It's kind of three different things. You need to have your selective, your specialized knowledge, but you also need to have a broad experience base. Then you also need to be open and imaginative. And the last thing is you need to be motivated. So it's not just your audience who needs to care about what you do. You need to care about what you do as well in order to really be creative in science. So 
there are a lot of different ways that you can help stimulate your own science communication skills and your own personal creative skills. I'm going to talk about just one way, which is the one that we happen to be using, and that's an arts integration approach. And art and science are both creative. You know, sometimes people say there's science and then there's creativity. What? <laughs> Really good science is, is creative. And there, is, there are some, some shared aspects of the process of creating art and creating science. But they are not exactly the same. And so there are things to be learned by dabbling in both or, or integrating either or in, in what you do. And de they definitely have different ways of, of thinking and problem solving. So science and technology often inspires art and then that art engages and communicates about science and generates in interest. We have lots of examples of that. All these movies and television shows, these wonderful quotes from the space era, we choose to go to the moon, the boot print. It's, we, we, we already know that. We've seen lots of examples of art relaying the big picture and the why of science. It can also be very inspiring. It, it can inspire others to do things and make life choices. So in case you're not as old as I am, this is Uhura, the chief communications officer, hint, hint, from the original Star Trek. And this was me at a party. <laughs> so um, I was inspired by Star Trek, not specifically about space, but about the wonders of exploring beyond what we know at this point. So anybody else? You don't have to admit it, but is anyone else remembering some art that may have inspired them at some point in their lives? I, I, think, I think if you give it a little bit of thought, you'll realize there's just a couple of things that influenced you, and you just may not have been paying attention. But art can also influence science and technology. So this is just one example underlying our modern computers and our cell phones are a lot of aspects that actually were um, stimulated by contributions from artists. And you know, we're not going to go through all that technology. Don't ask me what frequency hopping is. I did look it up, but you know, this is definitely not my field. But the point is that it's a two-way street. Art influences science. Science influences art. And it is important to uh, do things to train our skills so that we can be better scientists and science communicators. And what art allows us to do is work on our mental training. It allows us to, to think about those different ways of approaching problems. It also is really good at big picture capture. And and identifying the underlying most important points about something. And it also, in many cases, allows us to do that early prototyping. So mixing the art in your own science can be very helpful. And incidentally, a lot of inventions were made by people who were also practicing artists. These are just a couple of examples. The telephone, the steam engine, the telegraph. And it turns out that if you look, almost all Nobel laureates engaged in art as an adult, not just a child, not just those mandatory piano lessons. So that's, that's a very interesting thing. It reminds me that I need to try out for another community theater gig, you know, to keep my own creativity alive. So I'm going to tell you a little bit, this is sort of the last big section here, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our Humans in Space Art program and use it to furnish a couple of examples of art about science. So basically, uh, the Humans in Space Art program I started while I was a scientist at NASA, and it has, NASA, it has had NASA support all through the last nine years in, at different levels for different kinds of activities. And we have three projects that underline the program. The first targets children as the participants. The second is college and early career. And the third is actually professional artists. And the, all, all of those projects, the, 
underlying all of those projects are two very simple phases. The first is what is the participating artist group? Is we invite them to learn about space and the underlying science and technology, and we feed them some of that information, and then we encourage them to address a question about the future, but in order to relay their vision, they have to write us a symphony, or a short film, or paint a picture, or create a poem. So it's forcing them or encouraging them, rather, to think about the science and the engineering, but to put a creative twist on it. That's phase one. So that's touching the lives of the participating groups. The second is to then weave all of that artwork into multimedia live performances and displays online, locally around the world, and in space when possible, so that the artwork now engages the listeners and the viewers. So it creates a snowball of communication and creative thinking about this topic that we're interested in. So I'm going to start showing a couple of videos. And actually, we're doing OK, so I might actually be able to show you several videos. Uh, the, this is a trailer of, from a youth art competition. And the footage that you're about to see was taken from Cologne, Germany because we worked with the German Space Agency to, to be the opening ceremony for an international space meeting. And we had a contest the year before, and we wove the top winning artwork into this display and into this live performance. And in the one minute video, you will see a lot of young people. They are the top winners from around the world that the German Space Agency paid to actually come to this event and meet the astronauts and the managers and the scientists who are currently carrying, carrying out our space program to talk to them about their views and also to meet each other because one of the important aspects of this activity was to foster the future of international space relationships. So we'll just show this for a minute and hopefully the audio will work. This music was composed by a 16-year-old boy from Clear Lake. So one of the things that I'm going to say um, probably more than once is that whenever possible, it's, it's a good idea to include multi multimedia because not every person responds to the same kind of communication tool. So I personally am very much touched by music. And I think that the visual art that we get is absolutely spectacular. But when it's woven in with music as well, I know that I, we have seen the audience crying because of just the, the emotional impact that the combined artwork gives. So we have been lucky enough to receive thousands of artworks from around the world up until this point and to display and exhibit this artwork in more than 100 places around the world. There have been hundreds of thousands of listeners and viewers. We've been on the International Space Station twice, and we bounced visual art off the moon using radio waves. So we are trying to be creative with how we use the artwork as well. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples specifically of the artwork. And while I'm doing that, I thought it might be kind of interesting. I'll tell you who the audience was. The audience is very broad, multiple ages and multiple countries. But maybe you can think a little bit about, do you see evidence for the so what and the tell story? And I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. So you know, it's just going to be kind of like a quick little stream of consciousness going on in your head. 
but it'll be the beginnings of a chance to exercise some of the things we've talked about. So the first examples are going to be from the youth art competition, and they're going to be visual art, and there, there are a couple of lit literary quotes mixed in there. So the, the youth have talked about a lot of different topics. Some of those topics have included the dreams and the underlying human need to explore. So they have touched on the intellectual process and just the way that human beings are constantly asking questions. They've also talked very much about the different steps and destinations that we will visit going forward with the space program. So they have touched on what they think are their views of the important strategy. There's been a lot of discussion of whether robotic or in-person exploration is important. What are the tools? Will we be ha having habitats and colonies, rovers? What are we going to be using? And there's been a lot of discussion of the value of the research and also of commercialization going forward. And on the topic of creativity and collaboration. And one of the driving whys for space exploration is looking for life elsewhere and also because many of our young people are concerned about the state of the Earth at this time and whether or not making the human race survive means we have to go somewhere else. So very interesting topics expressed, and these are all children, all the artwork you're seeing so far. And I, there were a couple of quotes there, but you know, just in all fairness, this is a longer excerpt of a poem written by a young girl from Macedonia. And you can see the progression of the story. It starts off with a, a, a young girl asleep in her bed and moves on to her imagination and her dreams. And then she goes through her discovery and learning and preparing phase. And it ends with, she can hear the engine now as it roars between, beneath her feet and finally she knows infinity is within her reach. So it's just a very lovely, simple capture of kind of a very important thing and gives a lot of the so what. Now this is also a children's example and it is an excerpt from a, a symphony piece written by a 14 year old boy and the inspiration for this piece was this image of the, from the Hubble Space Telescope. This is the Pillars of Creation and it is believed to be a capture of, the, of gas and dust forming new, st new stars. And so what we've done is we've overlaid an excerpt of his audio with this image so that you can get this kind of multimedia feeling of some things that we know about the universe. I hope you were feeling that the universe was immense and unearthly. Very, very powerful, 14 years old. So the second project 
actually targets college and early career professionals, so that's more the demographics of the group we have in the audience today. And I'm just going to show one example. The top winner for this particular ISS program was actually an animated film from a team in Australia, and it's really beautiful, and if we have time, I'll show it to you later. But um, I wanted to show this one because it, it's more suitable for this demographic. It's a team of students from Georgia Tech. And their, their piece is called We Need Space. group actually followed up on their video using a hashtag we need space social media program so they really tried to amplify the value of their artwork and I hope you you, you got a sense so far we're, we're not done with ex examples but of some of the attempts to weave in a storyline in these different formats to hit the so what to use multiple media to use many different literary devices different types of uh, even within a given media, different styles. So, and remember the call to action because your chance is coming soon. So, uh, the last project that I mentioned is the Celebrity Artist Fed Engagement or Cafe program where we actually take it upon ourselves to introduce a professional artist to science and engineering. We take them to see the things, we take them to talk to the scientists, and allow that to inspire their artwork and then we stand back and let them do what they do well which is to communicate about the science and I'm going to take a couple of minutes to show you a piece that we did working with a professional Japanese pop star it's extremely cultural so it may or may not be your personal taste but this is about communicating and, re and respecting different forms of communication and creativity. And hopefully you'll notice that 
that as a powerful storyteller, she's using role models and symbols throughout this piece to actually tell her tale. Obviously, that was a call to young women to put their footprint on the moon. So, now is your turn not to put your footprint on the moon necessarily, although that is also an awesome goal, but I'm thinking a little bit short, shorter term than that. 
We are actually funded by NASA right now to host a film and graphic arts contest about going to Mars. And the target audience is career and early is college students and early career professionals. The artwork is not due until August. It's a fantastic opportunity for you as an individual or a team to actually learn something about our, how we're going to get to Mars and to cre create something that communicates your vision of that future. And it, you can, uh, one of the target audiences for this is, is the actual practicing artist. Like much of what we do, and which has not been the emphasis of today's talk, we are actually trying to create these activities to reach not just to those who self-identify as scientists and engineers, but also reach the artists and encourage them to learn about space and science and technology. So this is another one of those projects. There's a lot of target towards the artists community. And if you want to put together a team, it's also a marvelous opportunity for you to perhaps find people who are not like you and don't have your skills but have some of the other skills that it would take to work collaboratively to create a marvelous communication piece about space. And if training yourself and doing some good for the world is not sufficient, the artwork also has high payoffs. The, the top films and posters will get in front of the director of Star Wars Rogue One and also some of the top creatives at a, a, a famous graphic arts organization called McCann, and some astronauts and other personalities, including Mohawk Guy, who some of you might remember from Curiosity Rover days. And in addition, there's lots of cash prizes. So you can choose your motivation, but I'm strongly encouraging you to apply some of your skills to actually generate a communication piece that would be broadly appealing to the public. So we've talked a lot about the so what. Science, so what. I hope that we have answered a little bit of that and, and helped you to understand how we can maintain and relay science relevance. And some of those underlying keys include communication and thinking creatively about science so that it continues to evolve and be of use, and also so that we can foster public understanding and engagement. Art integration is a tool to help with your self-training and for you to use with your communication. And there's a lot of stuff out there about actually how you make your scientific figures and graphs that involve some art integration techniques. So there's a lot of stuff that we haven't talked about today. And I have now made a request to all of you to do your part and train your, your communication and your imagination skills and be creative in how we think about science and how we shape the future because, after all, the future depends on us. So that's all. And I finished almost exactly at 8 o'clock, <laughs> even though we started late. So I hope that you felt like you got something out of that. We do actually have a couple of minutes for any questions, comments, go backs. Um, thank you. Question. Yes. I was pretty sure that it wasn't until I saw the last slide that Nicole, um, this is the same project that the unity that these ribbons and uh, children with cancer and these new tubes, two spaces that were designed by children, right? So Nicole and I work together a lot. She's actually one of our board of directors members, and so we we cross we cross fertilize a lot in what we do. That particular project actually was started by a gentleman at MD Anderson, and then he brought the idea. What he was doing was actually having children create cancer victims create children create artwork as a therapy, and then he would weave those into marvelous sculptures that lined the hallways of MD Anderson. And he had this idea, what if we have people create art and then we make a spacesuit? So he brought that idea to NASA, and then Nicole actually helped to make it happen. Uh, because one of the interesting challenges, you know, I'm, I'm using 
I'm using art integration as a tool because I care about the future of science and technology. I do also care about really fostering an understanding between very different kinds of people. So, you know, the scientists and the engineers, not all of them, but occasionally they kind of look down on people who think differently from them. I hear a lot of the, you know, oh, the artists, they're so flighty, you know, all of that. Well, I've done enough research now to realize that there are members of the arts community that think that scientists and engineers are totally televisioned and narrow and they look down on us. And so my sort of general view is if we can figure out how to get the scientists and the engineers and the artists to work together to, to solve a problem or do some good together as a team, then we can handle all the different kinds of people that are in between that broad continuum of different kinds of people. And uh, the space suit project crosses some of the same lines, but that is not actually a product of our program. But we have, we have co-exhibited a lot. <laughs> so, any other thoughts? Yes, please. Has there been a project that's actually been, um, like, made and, um, like, the science that they've been seriously and have tried to actually, you know, come up with this space? Uh, a piece of art that, that the scientists have taken seriously? Yes. There actually are quite a lot. Well, first of all, the generalization I gave you was a generalization. There are plenty of scientists and engineers who have great respect for arts, and many of them practice the arts themselves, and, and vice versa. There are lots of artists who are, there's a whole cadre of artists out there, and I've been very fortunate to meet a lot of them who are creating art about space. And um, so, yes, there are examples of that. You may be aware that we have also done a lot of things to actually send art into space, not just with our program, but there's something called the Golden Record, which was sent on the Voyager spacecraft, which actually was a chronicle of different forms of human communication, basically, recorded on a, on a record and sent on the Voyager. And there are a lot of examples, and there are more examples. Uh, just recently, there's, there's a little bit of controversy about this, but there was a satellite sent up there uh, that looks kind of, I, 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 don't, I didn't read a lot about it, but it looks kind of like has geodesic reflective surfaces. And they shot it up just recently. And it's supposed to be really cool because it will reflect the light. We can see it really well from the Earth, and it's just supposed to be kind of a really wonderful piece to help people think about space, but also the connection to us here on Earth. It, it's, it's really fascinating because it's a technological achievement as well as a work of art. But the reason I know about this is because some of the astronomers were mad at them because it's reflecting light, and now their, their Earth-based telescopes are going to have interferences in their camera images. So um, it's, you know, it's a challenge to find this balance that, that makes everybody happy. But I think that that's a fascinating thing to do. So I hope that answered your question somehow. <laughs> Any other thoughts or questions? Is anybody going to be in the contest? Come on. We need some really good stuff from you, H. Clear. Like, I'm assigning that as your mission. So, yes, sir. Is there any study of the percentages of engineers that, that are artistic? Uh, Not artistic, but artistic. artistic. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and in the art field, what percentage might be? Uh, I might have to do with perception. Right. Uh, I would not be surprised if that data were out there. I don't know the answer, but I, I think I see where you're going with that. And uh, it's a very interesting question, and I will go Google that later, in case anybody ever asks me that question again. Um, but, but, you know, a lot of people, one of the interesting, well, I hope it's interesting, one of the points that I'm trying to make is that, you know, as a scientist, a biologist in particular, a neuroscientist, I, I, I do realize that, that the human body is hardware, right? And, you know, there are some inherent bounds 
because of what you inherited with your hardware, your DNA. But I really actually believe that, that the, the mind is, is so plastic, that there's so much we can do within those boundaries. I, I think that everybody has analytical and creative capacities, and that it's up to us to train those capacities, to not be lazy about it. And sometimes, as you know, the best things are really hard. But I think that the value that you get from using your entire brain is just worth it. And so I'm hoping to encourage you to stretch a little bit in what you do. And I'm talking not, not just over the next three months, but over your decades to just keep adding to, to your skill day. So, yes, sir. I'm sorry, I can't hear you that well. Since you're a neuro, neuroscientist, I figured maybe this is a good opportunity to ask this question. Uh-oh, it's a big deal. Uh, I guess from some other uh, uh, forums that I've been associated with, it's uh, the people that talk about driving on interstellar flights. And then, of course, there are a number of different coaches, but one way the coaches try to minimize what you transport. Uh, so it kind of comes to the question is what is consciousness? And uh, in that, how much do, of the human body do we really need to maintain consciousness? So, so are, you, are you sure getting the point that maybe we can send only the key important parts of the human? Well, there's a, uh, there's a benefit, as it were. I mean, it makes it more possible. But, uh, at the same time, it seems like, the, from this standpoint, the 21st century seems like a very difficult thing to say that we can trust somebody and help us in part. But at the same time, since we all hear the consciousness, I kind of wonder what is consciousness. Well, I, I agree. I think that's really a fascinating question. And I am, that's totally out of my cells and, and molecular experience. But having said that, um, you know, I do try to keep up with current events and news and I, I, my, my guess is that we're pretty far from being able to understand the human mind and the human body enough to just distill out kind of the minimal needed for consciousness. What I think is an interesting thing and maybe it's because I have a, a son of, who's about to graduate in computer science and I'm wondering what he's going to get a job in. Mm -hmm. But I'm thinking that artificial intelligence is a very fascinating field right now. And I, I was directed towards an article that basically said, I think it was something like in 40 years, so much of what we do now will be replaced with the, you know, the huge exponential advances in artificial intelligence. And my takeaway take from that was all the more reason for us to expand our value to not just do, you know, I think the hardest thing they're going to be able to simulate is that amazing plasticity of what it means to be human. And so it is the creativity. It is the ability to make new connections. Now, I know that the software is getting really, really cool, and maybe we will be replaced ultimately. But um, I think that's, that's, that's an argument for why we need to, to keep on top of our own skills. So I didn't really address your question, oh, but it is very interesting. It sounds like there's something very much in there, because artificial intelligence raises the same question. Mm -hmm. I think there's a book that I think there's a car facing forward by Roger Penrose. Mm -hmm. He's uh, asking the same thing. What book is uh, Can't you have consciousness in the sheet? Right. Right, and, and how scary is that? <laughs> um, again, a, another film that will date me is 2001 A Space Odyssey. And, um, you know, the spookiness of how the computer... Uh, it's, I mean, I, I won't pretend I've totally understood that movie, but it sure does haunt you after you've watched it. So, any other thoughts or questions? I appreciate your coming to the first lecture of the series. Thanks very much, David. Um, and for hanging out and not all falling asleep. I really appreciate that. And if you have any other thoughts or you want to 
talk to me afterwards. I'm comfortable with that, and I have my cards if anyone needs them. Any last questions? Right, let's thank our speaker. Thank you. I do want to remind you guys, our next speaker is going to be Peter Brown, uh, who's coming from Texas A&M, and, and he's going to be talking about measuring the universe with exploding stars. So that's going to be next week. Um, there uh, is a recording of this, uh, which will be available online. So uh, please, uh, you know, if you missed anything, uh, just the undergraduates, if you're writing your first papers, you can go back and refer to this. And uh, we're also going to be uh, working on adding a post captioning to that. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh,